Hi everyone and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Dashni Pindia and I'm Programme and Operations Manager for The Real Ideas. Thank you for being with us on this cold Wednesday afternoon. Um, this is the final webinar in the series of our Community of Practice webinars, all based around the four C's. So if you've been following this series, then you will know that the four C's stands for creativity, culture, connection and community. And the four C's are really at the heart of what we've been calling, <coughs> excuse me, our approach to recovery curriculum thinking. So obviously post COVID, there've been a lot of challenges for schools and school leaders. So we've been throughout this webinar series, we've been discussing ideas and approaches to learning the curriculum and also well-being with an aim to inspire school leaders and creatives that are working across the creative and cultural sector. Now today, the topic is community. And um, for this discussion, I will be joined by two hugely experienced um, colleagues and guest speakers who have a great kind of wealth of knowledge linked to community collaboration in schools. And together, we're going to be discussing some of those ideas with you today. Um, so I will be asking our panel to introduce themselves shortly. But if I could just give a welcome to Ruth Cochrane, who is community lead at Hannah Moore Primary School here based in Bristol, where we are broadcasting from. Um, Hannah Moore Primary have a brilliant reputation for uh, working with their diverse, diverse community through a range of programmes, <clears throat> excuse me, and initiatives. And um, the school have also got a, a really great approach to working with their community and businesses across their site. So Ruth will be talking to us a bit about that shortly. Um, alongside Ruth, we have Pippa Jones, who is director and founder of Create Gloucestershire, um, an artist-led support network set up in 2011 with the aim of and um, mission, sorry, to make arts and creativity every day for everyone. And now I've had the pleasure of working with both Create Gloucestershire and Hannah Moore Primary through a range of programmes and projects. Um, so I'm really happy to have you here today. Before I get stuck into introductions, could I just run through some housekeeping with you? Now, I know that we're all kind of webinar and video call pros, but for us um, to communicate with you, we can't hear or see you. So we need you to communicate with us via the chat function, which you should be able to see on the right hand of your screen. Um, if you can leave your comments, thoughts and ideas um, a bit later on, we're going to be having about 10, 15 minutes um, for Q&A. So please do let us know um, what your thoughts are. And you can also um, engage with us online. So we'll be popping in our social media handles into the chat so you can engage on the conversation online and you can use the hashtag Real Ideas Online and we can pick up some comments um, and thoughts that way. I would like to say thank you to Maddie, who is our webinar producer in the background, just making sure that we're doing all the right things. So um, that's it. So make sure you engage with us and use that chat function. And now I'd like to hand over to my panel. So Ruth, would you mind going first and just giving us a bit of an overview of who you are and what the school does and your experiences linked to community? Certainly. Thanks, Deshni. Um, I think I probably need to start with the school. So the school I work at is an inner city primary school uh, in the centre of Bristol, a very diverse community and very deprived community. Uh, it's a school, school that believes very strongly in this idea of community, which I know we'll touch on later in the webinar. Um, usually we have about 350 children. Um, we also have usually about 40 uh, business volunteers coming in every week. And we usually have about 40 to 50 parents coming in every week to do a range of parent activities. So uh, it's very much a community school, but at the moment it's a very different school. Um, it's the where the school is is really key it's sort of poised really between two communities so you walk for four minutes in one direction and you're amidst uh, tall glass office blocks and the temple key development and the city very much the new city of bristol and also all the development which is going to be a new university campus and so on and you walk for four minutes in the other direction and you come to um what what has been called actually the Mogadishu of Britain, uh, Stapleton Road and a lot of social housing behind it. Um, it's a very busy community, it's very diverse, a lot of our families live in that area there. Uh, so it's really interesting to be on the boundary between those two very different places. Um, 
my role is very diverse as well. Uh, I'm community lead, so it really means sort of developing our school community, which I think means developing a sense of belonging and, and pride. And uh, it's quite difficult to pinpoint what that means. And I, I, I don't want to run over this, but I just wanted to use this little quick example of what I think sums up what makes the school such a great community. So a couple of years ago, we uh, some of our year five and sixes were playing a, an after school game of football against Clifton College which is possibly the leafiest and probably the most expensive public school in the city so a very different school in many ways and um, a couple of the parents came from Clifton College and they came in and they met uh, a Sudanese mum and a Somali mum in the entrance and they said oh we're looking for the football match and these mums sort of literally took them almost literally by the hand and made them so welcome and said you know come on this is our school welcome to Hannah Moore and took them down to the field and watched Clifton College thrash us in the game of football unfortunately um, and um, they just you know they stayed with them and they um, you know they congratulated them afterwards and they showed them out and so on and the next day in fact these parents or one of the parents from Clifton College rang the school and said I was just blown away by those parents you know I've never spoken to anyone from Somalia before and um, I'd really like to do something for your school and as it turned out you know she's um, well they later came in with a large check which was very welcome and we're now talking with Clifton College through this woman about the possibility of setting up um, ladies swimming at their swimming pool so that's just a beautiful example of what community means. So anyway, so my role is about developing community. It's also about linking to all the opportunities that Bristol has to offer. It's about involving volunteers. It's about offering activities to parents and families. It's about acknowledging that, you know, that sort of cultural capital and that that access to wider opportunities um, is not always there for our families. It's about building partnerships and maintaining them. So we've got some really long standing partnerships. You know, we've got volunteers who've been coming to the school for 15 years, which is amazing. And obviously, my role is about seeking out funding and support. Um, just a couple of highlights, I think, for me um, in my role, which has sort of spanned the last sort of 15 years at Hannah Moore as well. Um, one is that we have a group of mums called Bridging Gaps and they're a group of parents uh, that I got together about three years ago and the aim of that group is to develop and then deliver cultural awareness training. Uh, so we've been we've offered training to other schools and some, some business groups all around sort of understanding culture. And I think that's a really key thing that I love about the school is that we acknowledge that our community really is a strength and that businesses and other organisations have a lot to learn from us rather than just being the poor neighbour and saying, please give us some money. We know that the stuff that we can offer them too is a route into this amazing diverse community. Um, and I think the second thing that I would really uh, think is a highlight of my post is the, this, this uh, opportunity that I've had to nurture these relationships. And I think in the time of COVID, uh, particularly to see how relationships can de develop and the different things that people are able to offer us in these challenging times. Thanks. Brilliant. And quickly, before we pop over to you, um, Pippa, in terms of your role as community lead, is that quite a unique role for those that don't work in schools? Because I've not come across another Ruth in other schools. I've, there's staff who double up as community engagement, but not necessarily that have your role. I just wonder if that's Yes, I think it's really key. I think it shows the school's commitment to community. It is an unusual um, role. You do get family link workers or people who have all sorts of other responsibilities like attendance. Um, and that can really put you sort of in conflict, I think, because I mean, the, the, where my role sits is sort of somewhere between the parent community and the business community and the school and that sort of separateness and the fact that I'm not a teacher, I think, helps. Um, but yes, I mean, the school has committed to paying uh, my salary, uh, um, but I guess if we didn't manage to generate income and support in a range of other ways, then that would be under threat. Well, thank you so much. We'll hear a bit more about Hannah Moore and your work later on. But Pippa, if you wouldn't mind 
doing the same. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Pippa, Pippa Jones, and I'm the director and founder of Create Gloucestershire. Uh, so we're a network um, led by artists and arts organisations in Gloucestershire, a bit as it says on the tin. Um, Gloucestershire, for those of you who don't know, we're a um, county in the southwest, got a population of about 633,000 um, in urban areas, rural and market towns that sit a bit in between. Um, so Craig Gloucester's mission, as Deshney's already said, um, we're trying to make arts every day for everyone across the county and implicit in there is our belief um, that at the moment it's not equal, that not everybody does engage in the same way um, and we all suffer because of that. So over the last uh, 10 years we've been experimenting in different contexts about how we can get art and creativity out of maybe galleries, museums and libraries and venues and into schools and GP practices and supermarkets and parks and every other kind of place you can think of. Um, and we're invited into communities who want to make where they live those places more uh, creative, more uh, equal, more prosperous and um, where well-being is improved. Um, so we have strands of work around Create Health, we have strands of work around talent development, around leadership, but what I want to talk to you about today is our Create Education strand, which is really asking a really fundamental question about how can we ensure schools sit in a really rich, creative web of support and resources and energy that can um, enrich and diversify and extend the opportunities that children and young people have in Gloucestershire. Um, so how can we do that? And we've been experimenting in different ways alongside Rio for the last yeah, 10 years or so. And I think a lot of what Ruth said we would um, uh, back up. So the best way to ensure that that happens is for um, senior leadership in the school to say this matters. So we don't have all that we need within the school walls, but if we open our doors and look outside into that wider community, um, we can um, really, really uh, do something exciting with children. So uh, I think it needs uh, a whole school approach um, to want to engage with the wider community. And we found then that if you've got school leadership, you then need some kind of forum, some kind of uh, container, some kind of infrastructure where community groups and school leaders and um, parents can get together to discuss what they want to do and how they want to do it. So um, I'm going to later on tell you a bit about a group called Culture Matson, which is a group on a, a housing estate just outside Gloucester where um, parents, the policemen, the GP, the uh, teachers, the community workers, some parents, some young people, the church warden, where that diverse group of people come together to plan how to make Matson more creative and more equal. And the school is absolutely an anchor in that conversation. Um, and I think from their point of view, the school benefits because they suddenly have access to all these venues, um, whether that's the library or whether that's the community centre or the park, where they can take children, and do things with children. They also, um, get a really good insight into what's happening in the lives of the children that they're seeing in school time, some of the wider community issues that are going on. And they get, a range, they get access to a range of activities that are already funded, perhaps by the Arts Council, but also by other charitable trusts and foundations that they can then offer either in school or out of school to their pupils. On the other side, the community groups have access to a really, really good kind of access to children and young people in that, in that community. Um, they have the they can draw on the knowledge of teachers in terms of what the curriculum is and how what they're doing could align and add to that um, and they also kind of have the opportunity to uh, jointly look for resources um, so that um, by working together usually we found we can make most things happen that might need some funding because everybody has their own networks and by pooling resources things seem to happen in a way that they wouldn't if everybody was working alone so um, all of that thinking came together in a bit of a highlight for us, which was um, our whole school's dance project that was really asking what impact it would have in, two, uh, in both primary and secondary schools. We had six pilot schools. If we were able to offer dance in curriculum time rather than as an after school activity. Um, it was a two year project. It was in partnership with an amazing um, dance company in Bristol called Rise. Um, who both delivered the train, delivered the classes and also helped us with a talent development programme. So we had some Gloucestershire based talent. Um, 
And we were bowled over really by the impact that that dance project ha happened within the schools, both in terms of showing improvement in terms of attendance, but also in terms of educational achievement and individual children feeling more confident and feeling more um, able to, um, more resilient and feeling, feeling better about themselves. Um, but also how that had a shift in the empathy and the resilience of the class and the sense of teamwork and community within the classroom and within um, the wider school. So um, as we now look at COVID and recovery, I think how we can really embed those creative activities into schools and how the community can wrap uh, like a scaffolding around a school, a set of activities and a set of really experienced and skilled artists who can offer a range of different creative activities to respond to what children will be coming back with or those children who are in school in order to help them go forward i think it's a really important and um vital conversation for us to have both today but also um when we go back to our places of work brilliant <clears throat> i love that idea of the scaffolding that just wraps around and i think create gloucestershire you really, you really show how to do that really well so hopefully we'll hear a bit more about that shortly. Um, so we're going to get in, stuck into the conversation. So we've structured the conversation with three very broad questions just to keep us tight. Um, so the, the first question really is about what we mean by community from our perspectives, because everyone is going to have their own definition of community and what we mean by that. Um, the second, we'll get into some examples of communities and schools working together to create outcomes, some positive um, good news um, for, for Wednesday afternoon and then lastly given the challenges that um, schools are facing currently with COVID um, what do we need to see more of or what do we wish to see more of um, and picking up on um, Pippa's point there about how we all need to work together and create this scaffolding around schools I think is a really good point so in terms of community if I just kick off we are broadly defining community as um, place-based real and linking to socially enterprising opportunities where we can unlock funding and resource um, with schools firmly placed at the heart of their communities. Now, as a social enterprise, Real Ideas um, believes that commu community is at the heart of everything that we do. We're very purpose-led and we work with communities, peoples and places in order to make a difference, and particularly in areas of need. And in the context of schools, when it comes to communities, it's really about helping schools to see their community as a resource, um, a bit so touched upon what um, Ruth was talking about, how you can see your community as a resource full of rich opportunities, um, particularly for your children and young people, but also helping the community to see the school as a resource. So it's a lot about us helping both sides of the coin to see and work differently together. Um, and I just want to get the, get some insight from Ruth and Pippa, just in terms of your perspective on community and what you mean by community, because Ruth, I guess from the school's perspective, that can mean many different things. You've got your school community, you've got the business community that's just right outside your door, as well as your parent community. Um, so I just wondered if anyone wants to pick up on that. Yeah. Did you want to go first, Ruth, or shall I jump in? You drop in and then I'll and then I'll drop in yeah. after. I, th I think it's really easy for the com school community to be thought about as parents of the children who are in the school um, and I think what we found when you actually ask in a community who else is interested there's actually lots of other people who feel that the young people in that community in that village or in that in that um, estate belong more they're not just the schools if you know what I mean so that lovely African proverb, proverb that it takes a whole village to raise a child I think is a really useful one to think about when we're thinking about community I think um, what we found is that um, for instance, the Housing Association are interested in the health and well-being of, of children when they're not at school. Obviously, the, the crime prevention and the police, they're also interested. Um, people who have had children in the school have a sense of loyalty to that school. So there's a whole range of different stakeholders who have children and young people's best interest at their heart, but they're often not brought together or asked to come together. Um, around an opportunity 
as opposed to a problem. So there's quite often we find in communities meetings to be held because there's a problem because young people are hanging around in the park or uh, there's a problem with um, some antisocial behaviour or there's a problem with um, um, litter, whatever it might be. Like people are brought together around a problem, but it's much less rare, much less usual, usual for people to be brought together around an opportunity. And when you frame it as an opportunity, which is, are you interested in widening the opportunities that the children and young people have in this place? Um, you get a resounding resp response and you can draw in, as you've said, Deshni, volunteers. You can draw in the assets that are not usually joined together um, in service of children and young people and their health and well-being. And I think if that was the case before COVID, it's even more the case now because everybody is aware of how challenging these last 12 months have been for children and young people. So from our perspective, if you can invite people into a space to talk creatively and in a sense, a positive way about how to scaffold around um, the school, you get a very positive response. And I think also you get a very, not just focusing on children and young people, but I think people are also really aware of how hard teachers and head teachers work and how we can support them as well. So. I definitely see it as a as a conversation that is um, if you frame the invitation right and I think for a lot of arts and cultural organizations moving beyond a transaction to a relationship which is exactly what Ruth said it's very easy to sort of approach a school and say I've got a six-week drama project do you are you interested in it for your children you only get so far but if you approach it more from a, a, a longer term bigger wider conversation about we really want to support the children in your school to flourish and to fly and to dream and to imagine and to do something they might not ever have done and to fail and to learn that that's okay if you approach it in that way i think you can set up a a, a longer term and a more strategic relationship that i think adds value both ways absolutely um and definitely when it comes to looking at the challenges and opportunities in a community i think bringing those two things together and using the community in the school to kind of work those things through um absolutely Ruth did you have any points on that in terms of just picking up on a couple of things that Pippa said really I mean this idea of sort of long-term relationships is fantastic you know I mean I think in the time of Covid we've found that our relationship with some of our um volunteers for example has changed and we found that they can offer us completely different things um, and this is true for pre-covid as well you know when you when you know a volunteer uh, you suddenly find that you know they may come and read with a child or something but then you find out that they're also an editor uh, or you know and they have a, a, a friend who would actually quite like to be a benefactor for the school these are all true examples um, and um, or you find out that one of your volunteers uh, would like to come and play the last post at the Remembrance Day assembly, which is just like mind blowing the opportunity. And so it's about, you know, it's about seeing community and seeing the richness of it and being open to all the possibilities of it. I think the other thing that I uh, that I would say about community is it's really useful sometimes to start with what is around you. So one of the most useful things I've done in recent years is just literally to walk around the neighbourhood in the, the immediate vicinity of school and um, introduce myself to some people. You know, so as I said, it were in a quite a peculiar situation. So, for example, right next to the school is a scrapyard and they make quite a lot of noise and um, then kind of not ideal neighbours in some ways but you know that over the years they've done some amazing things for us including rescuing a child who was stuck in a car um and forklifting some stuff that we couldn't manage across the car park starting flat batteries for, uh, for staff and um, and just you know i've been in there quite a few times over the years and said oh if you've got could you give us a bit of money for this and um the proprietor of the scrapyard takes out his very large wallet and just peels off 10 pound notes which is excellent but also surrounding the school you know we've got a wet we've got a wood yard and we've obviously we've got a nursery we've got we've got a range of businesses small and large and we've got developers who are an excellent source of support you know they may um, they may not be the longest term relationship but often you know if you're building a complex 
development in the vicinity of a school you're there for sort of two or three years they're, they're, they're very keen to be involved and the best sort of developers I think um, we've uh, we've established a relationship recently with first place and I think somebody may be uh, attending this webinar from first place which is lovely the best sort of developers to work with are not the ones who come in and say oh we'd like to give you some money they're the ones who want to know about your school uh, so first place for example you know know about Hannah Moore and um, were a, were wanted to commission a mural artist to paint a picture of Hannah Moore in the school and it's that sort of two-way interest that's really really beneficial and it's those relationships that will really really flourish I think the other thing um, to say about community is that for schools it's really important to acknowledge that teachers are very often not of the immediate community, especially in a city centre school like Bristol. So you may, and one of the reasons, sorry, going back to the Bridging Gaps group of which I'm so proud, is that one of the reasons we set that up is because we were conscious that, um, you know, most of the children in our school are as one as one little girl put it you know mummy why are all the children in my class brown or black and the teacher is white and in fact one of the members of Bridging Gaps sort of picked up on this and she said that's really why I wanted to join Bridging Gaps because I want those teachers to know about the community here they're from very different communities and they need to learn and they need to you know have that opportunity to be open and ask questions and they need the community to be confident to talk to them about Islam or the journey that they've made to come to Bristol or you know why they've ended up here and so on so but it's an endless discussion community very interesting one as well definitely it feels like we're naturally going into kind of the second question which is about some of these examples of community and schools working together um, I think particularly during COVID but preempting COVID but one of the one of the good examples that we've got is um, working with Arts Council England across the southwest and also community partners um, and some amazing people who've been donating items to make up let's create art packs and Pippa I know that um, in Gloucester we've been working with you Matson to distribute these art packs across um, areas of need and I think that as a an idea and a concept coming to reality and just being able to provide children who are in need of some activities and they get a pack for, um, distributed at school has been a really great kind of simple idea but I just wonder if Ruth or Pippa you've got some other examples of some positive um, community collaboration. We did a similar thing with a, a local arts organisation called Studio Meraki and I think what was important is that they uh, recognised that not everyone would have those basic things to make whatever you were making that week so that the art pack included everything you know the scissors and the paper and the glue stick and so on and that they uh, this the, the the packs that they produced um built on each other week by week but yeah that, those, those are lovely projects um sorry Destiny, i've lost my train of thought there what what, what was that's your okay. question uh, oh, just sorry. talking about some examples but maybe if you could talk to us about bridging gaps because that's actually a really unique um initiative that you've got and that's been going for quite a few years now hasn't it yes it has um there's actually a lovely article in uh bristol 24 7 at the moment which is sort of online news um because it's, it's a group that's been hugely affected by covid it's a, a group of parents as i say that offer cultural awareness training but it we had a few Zoom sessions, but we really felt that the strength of that group is about the personal connections and the training, which is a lot about just introducing people to people from very different backgrounds and creating an atmosphere of trust and openness so that people can ask without fear of being looking silly or being non-PC or uh, thinking it's something they should know about anything to do with us, people from a different culture um, we, we do some simple th simple exercises around just making sure that teachers know how to say people's names properly because you know the embarrassment that um, teachers have about sort of uh, pronouncing Ahmed properly and not going Ahmed or whatever but the importance and the respect that it shows to that individual and that family is really really important uh, but as I say in times of Covid the Bridging Gaps group has 
really made a decision not to offer that training because we can't replicate those those open and honest conversations uh, over zoom it just doesn't work um, it perhaps it would if we were all much more experienced trainers but we think we've held off so what we've done in the meantime and what the bristol 24 7 article focuses on is to create a uh, a mini library of books around culture and they're adult books they're academic books they're novels and they're also children's books because you can introduce people and say oh you know talk to my colleague from Senegal or Somalia or whatever but also there is an onus I think on uh, teachers to find out about community and history and black history and culture so uh, the point of the mini library is really to sort of ask teachers to take that responsibility and um, you know use some of the time that they're not socializing or going out to perhaps read some books and educate themselves a bit more widely about culture so the Bridging Gaps group yeah it's, it, it's a lovely example of sort of a well, literally bridging that gap, gap between our community and other organisations. I think um, one of the key things about working together is, and one of the things that makes it easiest, is when you can work with organisations that share your values. So the most successful relationships we've got um, and the ones, the newer relationships that we've got that we know are going to go well are ones where we we understand, we're starting at the same point. So we've had a long, uh, a long relationship with the Windmill Hill City Farm in Bristol, for example, because they understand um, uh, the needs of our children and the priorities that we have and the un importance of enrichment and uh, and the concept of nurture and um, all sorts of things. So I think very occasionally we get um, offers from businesses who, you know, don't seem to share those values. And it's quite hard. I'd like I'd like to know how we how we start to 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 make sure those the sort of basic um, things that we hold dear are understood by everyone because it's 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 hard to build a relationship without that. That's true. Um, Pepper, I'd love you to talk about Culture Maps then, if that's okay, because I I think it's just a great example again of um, community and this talking about this scaffolding that you've wrapped around the community uh, the school there and how the community have come together. It'd be great to get some insight on that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, in a minute, if you can share the slide that I had, that would be useful. But I'll just talk a couple of minutes beforehand to give people a bit of the context. So um, Matson is a, the, I think it's the largest housing um, estate in um, Gloucestershire. Um, it has very high levels of, of deprivation, but very high levels of social capital. It's, quite, it's a strong community and there's a lot of people who care very deeply about it. Um, and there are two primary, three primary schools in the area and two, two of whom we've worked very closely together because they're in the same academy trust. Um, and I think what we, what we have done there over three, four years now is um, through regular meetings of, of the community groups, including um, public sector as well as the VCSE sector, as well as just, individ just individuals, as well as individuals who live in um, Matson's the residents. We've over the last um, four to five years been gradually and organically building up this sense of scaffolding around the children and young people in the in those in those in those schools. Um, so, as an example, um, we did a um, the library has a summer reading challenge, and they were um, struggling to get enough young people engaged with that uh, enough young people children engaged with that reading challenge. The school were on a real um, uh, mission to get their children to read more. So at one of the meetings, we just said, well, what about if we put the two offers together? What about if we used a competition around pebble painting that the library ran, um, that, the that the children were told about in school that ended up find, uh, uh, like a trail of pebbles that were painted all around the community that people found. And when they found a pebble, they went to the library and they then got engaged in the summer reading challenge. And figures that year for the summer reading challenge in Matson Library went through the roof and the school were really pleased because um, they had uh, a sense that the children were reading over the summer holidays when they weren't at school. So that's just a really small example about when you put two things together, um, something can emerge that helps both both the school and the community asset or the community, the community resource. Um, so if you could show the slide, Deshni, it'll give you, a hope, I hope, a sense of the um, 
opportunity and the energy and the resources that you can unlock um, around a school um, if you are able to in some way get the uh, host the partnerships that you need in order to do that so um, so I know that Maddie has uploaded it to the handout. So for the audience, you can download that there, but we'll just work on sharing that um, on our screen shortly. But if you, okay. it is a great graphic, yeah. isn't it? It's, yeah, and I think the, the, the really interesting story behind that is the um, two women who are sitting, I can't see it, so I'm just talking about it from memory, but the two uh, young women are standing on the island in the middle of the river um were two parents at the local school who um were approached by strike light festival which is a theater company in gloucester to help organize um a show that they wanted to bring to matson estate uh, particularly for young people and children a show directed at children and young people so they got involved because they were both great community organizers they got involved in producing and um putting the chairs out and the school let us use their lovely rake seating in their their hall and that has then grown for them um, doing that uh, initial task to then becoming really interested in how little theatre happened in Matson, um, starting to see shows that really resonated with them and their experience of living in Matson. And they've um, decided to set up as, a, um, as an independent theatre producing company, which they now are called GL4 Festival. So in terms of um, their journey as residents into the arts and cultural sector and now in employment, uh, with Arts Council funding for this fantastic um, festival of theatre for children is brilliant. So the school block book um, the shows that are for children, they use the school hall, but then the children also get to go to performances in other places. So um, through Rio, um, we managed to get some tickets to go to, was it the Lion King, Dashni, down yeah. in um, Hippodrome? Okay. So the children's experience of theatre and drama, they're both doing it in the school with some of the workshops that are organised, they're seeing it and the, the, the aspiration about what and how and what goes into um, contemporary theatre and performance has really changed amongst those children who've taken part. So that's a that's a, like a long term relationship and GL4 are now programming visual arts as well as um, perform, live performance. So the opportunity for that school to really enhance the experience that those children have alongside professional artists and companies is fantastic. But it's been it's definitely been mediated by um, those regular meetings, which are the Cool Culture Matson, where people come along and say, I'm doing this. Is that of interest to the school? And the school say, yeah, definitely. But it would need to be on Tuesday and it would have to cost one pound and we'd have to be able to involve the parents. So there's a um, constant kind of conversation and working out of how to bring things to the school so the children benefit but also how to get the children out of the school because for them a little trip to the library is a really exciting way of brightening up that day and they get another adult and they get other volunteers who can read to them it just broadens their horizons it brings in a different uh, a different ingredient into the school day um and um the the i think the, the real plus about having the school at the heart of culture matson is that what children then see, because they have no choice, because it's in the school curriculum, so like the dance programme that we um, scheduled, they didn't have any choice, they had to do it. They then, when there was an after school club or a Saturday club, felt confident going to that because they had met the artists and dance was no longer this thing that wasn't for them. So there's a sense in which if you, if you can introduce a cultural habit to children and young people in school, and you then provide the same artists and the same organisations and the same venues for them to go to after school or at weekends. You can establish a, a cultural habit that I think will be with children, um, hopefully through their lives. And so um, in another place we're working in a lot of depth is Cam and Dursley. And there's a fantastic venue there called Kings Hill House, which is quite near to both the secondary school and couple of primary schools again by starting to work in schools we did a, a digital storytelling competition and it was linked in with Kingsill House and with Dursley Library the children now feel more confident to access activities that are happening in Dursley Library and in Kingsill House and we've specifically curated work that would build that stepping stone from what children might have seen in school to that next stage so that's the join up that um, Ruth is talking about and that I'm talking about that's so important that it's not just people bumping along each other, but there's a sense in which you're starting to co-design and co-produce a, a place-based curriculum, some of which happens in school, 
some of which might happen in the library, some of which might happen in the church or the community centre or the park or the hill. But there's a community cohesion to the conversation, which I think is um, really interesting. And it makes that edu that, that school, um, it, it gives children the opportunity to really understand all of the things they have to learn through the national curriculum, but critically to really learn what their local community is all about and what assets are there for them outside of school. Um, yeah. Hope no, that's answer. brilliant. Um, and I was just going to say that the, the, the buy-in from the two schools it linked to Culture Matson is there, isn't it? At every meeting you've got a member of staff from the school in attendance. Yeah. yeah. And I think, again, that comes back to Ruth's point. Ruth's obviously got a dedicated role to this. The head teacher in um, the schools, all the schools we've worked in, um, a dedicated member of staff who can come to meetings and who's got some space in their head to be able to think not just on the day to day uh, reacting to what's happening in the school, but being able to take the longer term picture. I would say that's a vital ingredient in terms of making the scaffolding work because you you can't do it if if there's an imbalance between the capacity that the school has and the capacity the community has and likewise there's no point having an amazing outward facing community leader in a school um, if you haven't got the uh, cultural creative infrastructure there so you sort of need to develop both and you have to spot where you need to prioritize capacity and it could be that's somebody in the school but it could equally be you need a really good artist or arts organization to um, respond when um, the opportunities arise. Brilliant and we weren't able to share that um, model but for everyone at home if you can download the graphic it's called the Matson model graphic it, it gives a really good uh, visual representation of what Pippa was just talking about. So lastly before we go into some questions and answers um, given that the challenges that schools are currently facing which are vast. Um, what do we what do we want to see more of in terms of community collaboration? I don't know if I'll put Ruth on the spot here um, from a school's perspective. I don't know what would be useful or what do we need to see going forward? Well, I think some relationships and partnerships have have flourished um, during lockdown and so on um, but I think what we've done with others is made sure we've kept in touch so we've seen as I think I touched on earlier we've seen some volunteers saying oh well, you know I could um, introduce you to somebody who could get you some laptops or I can introduce you to so and so who could organize some art stuff so it's about being open to new ways of working and um, we've had direct support in different ways um, I think I mean we've our extensive links really paid off in terms of getting IT devices to children because we were just able to do that because we had such a range of firms saying, you know, here, have some laptops and such a range of individuals saying, um, here, have some funding. So, we, you know, we have been able to send home um, a, either a Chromebook, a laptop or an iPad home with every child that's at home, which is which is incredible, really. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to do now is sort of capitalise on those new, new IT skills. Now, this is not something that sort of sits very easily with me as a bit of a sort of non-IT person. But I'm conscious, for example, that one of the ways we've kept in touch with parents at home uh, who might normally be coming into school for an assembly or a, a class or a mum's netball session or whatever is to have these parent zoom meetings and interestingly some parents come to those zoom meetings who i've never seen at a parent class and i think um uh, I'm including a couple of parents who i know have significant literacy barriers so they can they can click on the Zoom link and join. They know they're not going to have any form filling to do. They, you know, they know they can leave whenever they want to leave. Uh, they can just engage in a different way, but also very much on their terms. So we really need to capitalise on that. I think we also need to capitalise on the fact that a lot of parents working at home with their children actually know an awful lot more now about what their children learn day to day than they did this time last year they may they may want to just send their kids back to school and forget all that but nevertheless you know they are quite empowered as uh, supporters of their children's learning so we need to look at you know ways to sort of just yeah capitalize on that use it um 
I think, yeah, I think the final point I'd say is what we need to build on is it, it, we very quickly uh, were able, did some quite comprehensive analysis of who was accessing home learning online and who was not, which is something that sort of, we've kind of um, thought about it for some years. Oh, you know, these children are disadvantaged because they don't have a laptop. But now we are very clear because those children are not attending Google Classroom or whatever. So that we need to make sure that we keep aware of uh, that as a barrier, and um, you know, uh, as we are uh, as aware as we are of other barriers that might be more obvious, like language barriers, for example. So those are the things I would um, pick up on. Oh, one final thing. I'm very concerned that a lot of children have lost a lot of physical fitness over lockdown. Mm. So I think we need to look at really creative ways. We know we're going to have to have a more flexible, uh, nurturing um, recovery curriculum. But I think building in opportunities for children to um, regain some physical fitness is going to be really, really important. Mm. Just getting outdoors as well, isn't it? Pippa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, a couple of things. I agree with everything Ruth said. So just to build on that, really, I think there's something about um, the blending that's happened between home and school and with um, uh, community arts organisations online. That's really interesting. So what we're thinking about moving forward in the schools we're working in is we're calling it a three legged stool. So we're, we're trying to future proof because we can't yet see this year being completely back to normal schools open everybody back. So we're thinking of how can we um create enough stuff that's delivered literally through the door i.e the creative packs that you mentioned Ashley. so that um there is something that somebody can access that doesn't require a computer but is a, a really beautiful art creative pack what and how could we provide tuition and tutorials online with artists that the children will recognize from before and then finally what venues can we prep and prime ready for when children can come that to make them particularly like safe and nurturing and, and creative so we reckon there's going to be an, a, a dance between those three routes of, of providing creativity to children over the next year maybe even a bit longer i think the other thing that um we're brokering at the moment is an informed and in-depth conversation with mental health specialists about how you can as a community best respond to what we don't yet completely know or understand that the young people and children have experienced during lockdown so i think in the groups that i've been in the last couple of weeks there's a sense in which um parent governors governors staff don't really completely know what might be coming their way but really want to have a bit more of a handle on what that could look like and therefore how they could respond um there's a danger that you just say right we're all back let's just get on with things and you don't recognize the loss and the grief and the trauma that some children might have experienced or you do the opposite and you spend too much time and you don't move forward so there's we've had requests for some for a, a seminar really with some different perspectives on how you can emotionally support young people in a way to grow the confidence of communities and parents and teachers to know how best to handle that um and I think the creative, like I think dance and um, obviously poetry and photography, all those creative activities are amazing for helping you heal and to help you tell what has you've been through. But it obviously has to be done in a, a really super sensitive and safe way. And we need to know a bit more, I think, about what that might look like. Absolutely. Thank you both. So just looking at the time, I think it would be great if we could go to some questions now. So hopefully the audience out there have got some burning questions for our panel. <clears throat> Let's have a look. Just while we're waiting for those to come through, um, in terms of partnerships and I guess schools working in partnership with their community, Ruth, I don't know if you want to just say, ha like, are there any tips for people on, in terms of getting started, um, in terms of nurturing those 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 partnerships and those relationships? I think. Um... I would um, reiterate that idea of just sort of walking around your community and looking at the opportunities. Uh, you just have to not be afraid to ask people as well, uh, which is, can sometimes be a bit awkward for people, I think. Um, but I think also, uh, 
you, you need to do a little bit of research about um, what organisations' priorities are. So, uh, and you need to think longer term. So, you know, if I'm talking to an organisation like Burgess Salmon, I, I know that they're interested in diversifying their workforce, you know, in 20 years' time. But, you know, they're also broad-minded enough to think about how they can invest in schools now to make that a long-term goal. Um, yeah, it's, um, I, I mean, I, I think, as Pippa said, sort of having someone in school who just has the, the time to keep their ear to the ground. So anything that comes into school, sometimes people offer us things and that's actually not really what we want, but they obviously want to make a connection. So I always have in my mind a list of things that we need help with or we need money for or we need um we need resources wise and so if people do offer us something it's it i always hear it as a message of well we're reaching out to you and i say well thank you very much we don't need any more of that but could you offer this um and sometimes um uh, as I say, we have we've had very different experience with businesses. Some of our long partnerships with Deloitte and with We the Curious and Bristol Ferries and and some of our newer relationships with, um, as I said, First Base and with a local business called Limbs and things. We're building, uh, funding a new bit of the playground for us at the moment, which is amazing. Are brilliant, but sometimes um, you have to. Uh, you have to invest a bit of time with newer organisations to tell them a bit about you, to tell your story to them um, and to offer them things like, you know, well, would you like some cultural awareness training or would you like to come and visit the school? Or would you like to meet some parents? So often if people say, oh, I want to know about your community at Hannah Moore, I say, well, you don't really want to talk to me. You need to come and meet some of our parents. So and, and I will very often do that and meet, meet with people or take people with me to meetings because you know they can talk much more and it's also it, it changes this sort of us and them the whole thing about community as a school we build relationships with parents so that we're on the same side so that if something if something goes wrong for a child then we're all talking from the same perspective we all want the best for the child but it's the same with um with businesses we, we don't want it to be like oh we're the people with loads of money and we'll give you some money we want to say we want to make this community a better place or we want to join up the dots and and, and i really loved pippa's point about you know sometimes it's about involving more than one organization so for example we took groups of children on the ferry on Bristol ferry boats to go to We the Curious and and that was double whammy you know the ferry boat were delighted to have more diverse people using their ferries lots of the people hadn't been on the ferry before We the Curious wanted a more diverse lot of people so uh, and and it was sustainable because all those people know how to get on the ferry they know that you have to buy a ticket and it only costs one pound fifty they also know what it means when you get to we the curious sorry which is bristol science museum for anybody who doesn't know people know what's behind the door because i often think that you know for some people going to a library or a museum in, in another country you don't know what to expect i i sometimes use the analogy of it be, but for for me, it would be a bit like going into a betting shop. You know, I don't know how it works. I don't know where to go or, you know, how to pay the money or just how to make it all work. So to have those supported introductions for people, I think, is 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 a great thing. Brilliant. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we've got one question. Um, so schools are often financially pressed um, and this individual would like to know how Ruth's role is funded and also how important she feels it is not to be doing the role as teacher, juggling it as an additional responsibility. So uh, yeah, schools are financially pressed and um, it, it, it's schools have to see it as an investment. And I mean, I think you, you know, you could cost a community role in lots of ways. Um, the school at the moment pays my salary. Uh, we haven't really investigated other ways of uh, it being funded, though we I think we'll do that in the future. Half of my salary comes from pupil premium, so that's you know obviously um, extra money that comes to schools uh, when children who are uh, means tested preschool meals. I'm sure everyone knows all about that. Um, 
I mean, I can, I, I do justify to the governors uh, quite often how much money, either real money or um, in kind money, comes in via our partnerships. And, and I think you have to be quite creative about that. It's not just about, you know, 100 laptops and, um, you know, some playground equipment. It's also about, you know, um, attainment of children and volunteer hours. There's a very good tool uh, now which um, a lot of people use for fundraising, which is about um, extracting the cost of social value. It's the hack tool. It's developed by Housing Association. I'm sure Deshni can send out that information in a clever way afterwards, but it's a really useful way of thinking about th um, money in a not just a pounds, shillings, pence way, but the longer term cost. Um, there is, I, I think also what COVID has taught me, I mean, it's, uh, we've had more money come into the school in this 12 months than we've had in any other 12 months into our friends of the school uh, account. And I think, you know, there is, there is money and support out there. It's just about building those connections and making sure that, you know, that, that, that the yeah, that things are joined up. Uh, and I, yes, I do think it's really important that somebody has at least part of their role uh, and that, that I think the person could be a teacher, but perhaps not a practicing teacher, because I think if you're a practicing teacher, then your your priority is always going to be that and you're probably pulled in too many directions already. So uh, for, um, obviously I'm not a teacher, so I'd say it's very valuable not being a teacher, but um, I think it's, a, it's more complicated than that. No, but I think if you knew Hannah Moore and the community and where it's like geographically positioned, I think you'll get an understanding of why Ruth's role is really important and integral in that school. And I think it's, yeah, it's hard if you don't know the school in as much detail, but I think it just, it, it goes to show it's, a, it's an investment and they believe in, community engagement and working with the community in that way don't they they do i mean it's a i mean i mentioned it's a very diverse school we have a big somali community we have a you know a big caribbean community we have people from other european countries and those people don't necessarily meet in the community so that's why we run such a busy program of activities for parents because we need to build those relationships um, you know, before before I started at the school, I hadn't I hadn't met someone from Somalia. I hadn't spoken to someone from Senegal. But you know, once you've met one person from that community, then you get to meet all the other people. Um, and I think it's uh, you know, so if we run a, a parent netball session, for example, a mum's netball session, then you you just see all these relationships sort of and these conversations happening across the playground. You kind of think, oh, I didn't know that mum from Poland knew that mum from Italy or Sudan or whatever. And it's great. And those things, um, those ripples move out so that the community does really become more cohesive. And, you know, we acknowledge what we've got in common, which is that, you know, um, lots of people say, oh, Hannah Moore, it's like my home. Um, and it, it isn't, it isn't like a home, but, you know, we, we want some of the warmth and some of that nurture and some of those relationships and some of that welcome uh, to be felt in the school. So um, I, it pleases me when people do say that. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. OK, well, we are coming close to five o'clock. It's almost dinner time, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to start to wrap up, seeing as we don't have any more comments or questions. Um, I think we're all acutely aware that community has become more important than ever. Um, and we've seen some wonderful examples of communities coming together. But I think in the context of schools and picking up on the points that both Pippa and Ruth have made, I think we really it's all about us coming together and we all have a, a part to play in that in that journey, I think. So I just want to ask Pippa or Ruth if you've got any final comments or points that you'd like to make before we wrap up in terms of going forward. No, <laughs> fine if you don't. Pippa! <laughs> well, I, think, I think what I was going to say was that um, we, need to, we need to shift the system and we need to shift more money into schools and community and all the preventative work that we've been talking about and away from 
uh, expensive interventions when things have unraveled and gone wrong. And when I listen to Ruth and the way she described school as a home, as a family, it just feels like if children could grow up in that kind of environment, that is a whole village raising a child and we would have less problems later on. So I'm my, my closing comment is, uh, um, a plea for the system to support and fund the kind of work that Ruth's doing, the work that we're doing to prevent some of the things developing that um, happen if you don't have that sense of scaffolding around a school and if you don't have teachers and parents who feel supported as they bring up children today. Brilliant, thank you. Well, positive and inspiring words to end on, some system change going forward. Um, this, of course, isn't going to be the end of this conversation. At Real Ideas, we're going to be continuing to talk about it. And I'm sure we'll be sharing our thinking and more of our thoughts with you um, online in some way. Um, the easiest way to keep in touch with us is to become a Real Ideas member. So if you've not signed up yet, you can do so by visiting www.realideas.org forward slash membership. And um, there'll be a recording of this webinar in our members portal too. So in case you've missed anything or you'd like to watch it again, maybe you would. Um, and you can also find out about um, our upcoming events. I'd, I'd love to thank my panellists today. You've been brilliant. I could talk about community with you all day, but we haven't got time. But um, thank you so much. And if you want to find out more about Hannah Moore Primary and also Create Gloucestershire, please download the webinar notes. Um, there's more information there for you. Um, thank you for being with us. That's it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.